Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. So welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's podcast, Head to Toe, as we move around the body. My name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the college's heritage manager and librarian. And I'm Olivia Howarth and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we are talking about the womb. So let's start with the basics then. So let's talk about the physical womb itself. There was a physician in the 12th century who wrote that women have two uteruses, which corresponded with their number of breasts. And then some anatomists argued that the uterus had horns. Vesalius uh, describes them as resembling the immature horns of calves. I've seen some drawings. If you imagine like a light bulb, but with horns at the top, that's how they've depicted the womb. Mm. Yeah, there's something going on there, but um, (laughs) I'm not quite sure what. There's a lot about the structure of the womb and how it was meant to reveal the number of children likely to be birthed from that womb or the sex of the children. There was a guy called Master Nicholas, and in his book, The Anatomy of Master Nicholas, he says that the uterus is hollow and villous within, smooth outside, divided into seven cells and has two openings, which kind of reflects the widely held view that the uterus could produce a maximum of seven children at a time. And it was argued that there were three cells on the right side of the uterus, which would develop male embryos, three on the left, which would develop female embryos, and one in the middle, which would create what they termed a hermaphrodite embryo. So this is seven simultaneous children is the maximum, or seven over the course of a lifetime is the maximum. I I think they mean simultaneous. I suppose that is part of obviously what's so fascinating about the womb is it's shrouded in so much mystery. It's something that people are so uncomfortable talking about to an extent now, but obviously particularly historically, that it is this just sort of mysterious body part with mysterious functions that is far too gauche to talk about at a dinner party. So one of the things that I was thinking about and and reading a bit about was, of course, menstruation. And that's one where particularly, you know, the the more you read the sort of historical texts, you've got the courses, the curses, the flowers, on the rag, the ordinaries, the visitor, so many different euphemisms. But yes, so in so many different cultures, obviously, including our own, there is a lot of stigma attached to it. I found a quote from Pliny the Elder. So we're talking about sort of AD 70 here. And he says that menstruation is productive of the most monstrous effects. Crops will wither and die and bees will forsake their hives if touched by a menstruating woman. We've got the power. (laughs) We do have the power (laughs) to make bees flee. But it's this strange, and I guess this is sort of inevitable in any sort of history, that it's not a nice, clean line where everything makes complete sense. Because that's also counterbalanced by the idea that menstruation is necessary. It does fit in with the idea of humoral theory. The loss of blood is part of your kind of humoral balance, and it's absolutely necessary for your health. And there was an idea that if you had particularly heavy period, then you could treat that by bloodletting in the week leading up to your period, and there Therefore, you would you would menstruate less because the blood had already been removed. So menstrual blood and bloodletting blood, there wasn't a clear line between these. These were all just blood. And any woman who didn't menstruate didn't sort of rebalance herself correctly. And therefore, a non-menstruating woman, particularly thinking here of older women, women who've gone through the menopause, therefore have more masculine traits because that, that rebalancing of the humours hasn't taken place. So there's a lot going on there. It brings to mind the damned if you do, damned if you don't. (laughs) Oh, it absolutely is. 
So when we're talking about the womb, obviously the very large topic that comes to mind is pregnancy. There's a few tricky things when looking at the history of pregnancy. One of the things is that the word abortion historically did not mean the same thing that it means now. So in the 1600s, 1700s, if you see the word abortion, it could as equally mean miscarriage as it means an intentional ending of a pregnancy. The other thing is the idea of quickening, when you know for sure that you are pregnant. So conception would often be unclear for quite a long time. So it wouldn't be a sudden knowing like it would now when you would do a test. It would be a sort of process over many months of going, oh, this seems different and this seems different. And quickening the moment when you physically feel the movement of the fetus is when you know. And so there was this idea that that it's really only with the quickening, usually about five months in, that you are actually pregnant. When you're thinking about pregnancy in a legal sense or a social sense, it is not from conception, it is from quickening. And you can see that in a bunch of ways. So one of them is the idea, and this kind of lasts from about 1300s to really up to the almost the 1800s, is the idea of pleading the belly. So pleading the belly is when you are pregnant and you are facing execution. And as a woman, if you are pregnant, you would plead the belly. You would say, I am pregnant, therefore I should either have a stay of execution for a period of time or not be executed at all. But that only applied post-quickening. On the subject of pregnancy, one route that I went down is the subject of monstrous births. Is this something that you have come across? Um, no. Monstrous how? Well, it's difficult to know because, so this is sort of in the, uh, particularly in the medieval period, and it's particularly connected with Christianity. The difficulty in knowing is that the version that we get is monstrous in the sense of a pregnancy that is a serpent or a dragon, or it has hooves. So the version that we get, the illustrations that are in the books from that period are of these sort of fantastical creatures. And they are particularly connected with early Christianity. And it is all this idea that this is an omen or a warning of God's anger. So it might be directed against the specific family who are having the child, or it might be directed against the whole community, but it's you've done something terrible and you are being punished. But obviously what we don't know is what is literally happening in reality. So it could be that this is an entirely fictitious scenario, or it could be that there could be a child born with a disability, and that this has then become this exaggerated, fantastical narrative. So it's very difficult to know what's actually happening, because the version that we get is definitely not what's actually going on. And obviously that probably connects to the fact that there's a real lack of understanding of the pregnant body and how pregnancy works, which then allows for people to go down these sort of fantastical routes of um, serpents and dragons and things like that. I did find like a strong connection between pregnancy and toads. It was an article I was reading about votives displayed in a museum in Austria. And there's one particular one called, uh, I'm going to say it really badly, Gebarmutterkrota apologies, which translates to womb toad. And it's a wax votive normally in the shape of a kind of toad turtle thing that is meant to be symbolic of the uterus and offered as either Thanksgiving for like a successful childbirth or for someone to like intercede with any other kind of gynecological problems. In medieval Europe, toads were often associated with childbirth and toads were thought to have the power of spontaneous generation and resurrection. That's a lot put onto a toad. Yeah. <laughs> They're very cute though. Just Google womb toad and it'll go. <laughs> there was a recipe for getting pregnant. You should eat a fish that had been found inside another fish, fry it with a hare's liver, grind it to a powder and drink it in water because the hair was also a symbol of fertility. There's a book, The Distaff Gospels, an old French 15th century collection of popular beliefs held by late medieval women and contains a lot of advice about conception, childbirth and determining the sex of children. One of my favourites was clench your fist when you're making love and that will ensure you've got a boy. Also, if you make love to someone that has dirty or smelly feet, um, then your children will be dirty or smelly. Did you have some things about hysteria or the womb? 
wandering around the body. Yeah, we can go for a hysteria. Although Galen said that hysteria existed in men and it was attributed to sexual abstinence and retention of sperm. There is this idea that by the 1700s and, you know, even earlier, hysteria has shifted from being about this wandering womb to then being about the nerves. And so it's much more of a, a sort of mental, psychological thing, which is true, but it still remains as a very gendered thing. And there is still this idea that hysteria connects to your menstrual cycle. So the connection with the womb still remains. It's just not quite this wandering womb thing from before. Looking at records like the Edinburgh Infirmary records, the Edinburgh Dispensary records, poor women are being diagnosed as hysterical quite often. It's not a specifically a disease of wealthy people, which is what you maybe get from films or books. And again, the reasons for it, we don't know for sure, but may well be connected to malnutrition or, or you know, various deficiencies or problems in people's lives. And again, the, the doctors are very suspicious and think the women are faking it. So we don't know exactly what the cause of, of the hysteria is, but they are being diagnosed with hysteria. So the idea that it's a disease of the rich doesn't seem to be true poor women are diagnosed as hysterical quite often. Sticking with the pregnancy and, and childbirth side of things, one thing that comes out a lot is the growth of male midwifery. One of the things that really stands out looking at the early history of male midwives in the 1700s is how many of them are Scottish, which I find kind of fascinating. A lot of the big names, the William Hunter, the William Smelly, all these sort of big, important people were Scottish. So I got quite excited about that and trying to figure out what it is that's happening that means that Scottish physicians are more likely to become midwives than English physicians, or at least the prominent ones. There's a couple of arguments for why it's a particularly Scottish subject, one of which is midwifery is just accepted as a university grade subject much earlier in Scotland than it is in England. So from 1726, midwifery is taught at Edinburgh University. It still takes a while to get kind of full legitimacy, but relatively early on it's a subject. But also, Scots are excluded from a lot of high profile jobs in England. A lot of roles in England are only for graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. They are only for members of the College of Physicians of London. And you cannot become a member of the College of Physicians of London if you have studied at Edinburgh. You have to have studied at Oxford or Cambridge. So it's a very closed world. So Scots tend to pop up in slightly weird places. They tend to be like setting up their own hospitals or dispensaries or going to sea and being ship's doctors because they can't attain a lot of more legitimate positions. So Scots are a bit like Quakers because they have to sort of... <laughs> Olivia's making a face. <laughs> but people who study medicine in large numbers, but cannot go through the accepted route that a sort of wealthy English physician would go, meant that you do sort of pop up in lots of odd places. But it can be a very good thing. It can mean that a lot of dispensary founders and a lot of writers have gone down these slightly odd routes. They have to forge their own path, I guess. I'm now thinking of Quaker Oats and I can't help myself. <laughs> And there's, there's also, there's a lot of Quaker doctors who are associated with Edinburgh. So a lot of Quaker doctors from Newcastle or Sheffield or, or wherever would come up to study medicine in Edinburgh because they wouldn't be admitted to Oxford and Cambridge or because of their religion. So there's a lot of Quaker connections in medicine in Scotland, not purely via the medium of the oats. <laughs> In today's case study, we're going to look at the history of the menopause. While the term menopause did not come into use until 1821 from the work of a French doctor, Charles de Gardin, descriptions of symptoms can be found from earlier records, which have many resemblances to what we identify as the menopause today. In a book called Discovery of Witchcraft, dating from 1584, there is a reference to women, quote, upon the stopping of their monthly melancholic flux or issue of blood, being particularly susceptible to being accused of being witches. This ties into humoral theory, the idea of the need for a balance of humours, and menstruation being a healthy release of blood. Without that release, according to this theory, the woman's body could become corrupted. The menopause receives almost no attention in medical literature up to the 1700s, some historians have argued that the subject was simply not viewed as a medical one. The menopause was known and at least somewhat understood 
at least as far as it was a process occurring to women at a certain time of life, but that it was viewed as natural and not the preserve of doctors. Other historians have characterised the omission of menopause from medical texts as a sign of indifference towards the elderly and those women who no longer had a procreative purpose. But this changed in the 1700s. One writer, a Prussian physician, referred to the process as, quote, the end of menstruation as the time for the beginning of various diseases. Menopause was seen as a problem, something which brought about sickness. Popular advice literature began to appear, and menopause became part of the mass commercialization of wellness. Menopause supposedly could cause scurvy, cancer, and epilepsy. Terms like the critical age and the unthroned queen were used to refer to menopause. And by the Victorian era, there was a wide range of writing on the subject. Some menopausal women were thought to suffer from something called climacteric insanity, a disease whose symptoms included depression, anxiety and restlessness. Some recommended these women be institutionalised, while others recommended their ovaries be removed. Edward Tilt, who authored the first full-length book about menopause in 1857, listed over a hundred symptoms of the menopause, including weight gain and insanity. The treatments Tilt recommended ranged from opium and alcohol to douches which contained lead. Interestingly, while Tilt argued that menopause could cause alcoholism, many of his recommended treatments involved either alcohol or opiates or both. In today's short clip, we hear from Professor Helen King on womb votive offerings. Votive offerings, a feature of lots of cultures across time. Votives are given to the gods either because you want them to do something for you or in thanksgiving for them having done something. The word votive technically means it's in fulfillment of a vow. You vowed a model of your penis to the gods if they did something, and they did, so here's a model of your penis. They mostly date from, hmm... 3rd century BC onwards, and most of the votive wombs come from Italy, not from Greece. So we have terracotta votives like these. Terracotta is the votive material. What, however, don't we have? What's lost? So, for example, were there fabric wombs dedicated to the gods in antiquity? We don't know. Were there wax wombs dedicated? We don't know. How much are they personalized? Can you personalize one? We don't know enough about how these votives were bought and sold, but everyone assumes, based on not a lot of evidence, but it seems okay, that you would have someone selling them on the way into the healing sanctuary. Lots of them are mold-made, so they're, mult- they're basically manufactured in a sort of factory style. You know, lots of them, and they're, they're hollow because they're made with a mold. Often the front is patterned and the back is just plain, suggesting you put them lying down. But some of them, you could stand up. So again, do wombs mean the same thing if you lie them down or if you stand them up? We don't know. I have a a theory, it's unprovable, but there we go. I have a theory on the belief in the ancient world that women's menstrual blood is like the flow of blood from a sacrificed beast. This is in Aristotle and in the Hippocratics. And it's often been interpreted as a very anti-woman thing to say. Oh, how ghastly to treat women like they're sacrificial animals. I just wonder if for a woman to believe that your blood is somehow like that of a sacrificed beast is a good thing. Because sacrifice is what links humans to the gods. It's what keeps your city safe. If your blood is a sacrifice, that's good, not bad. Now, so the sorts of things that we've got here, then, are suggesting to me that there are a number of things we still don't know about these ancient images, and that somehow looking at modern images can at least change the questions we ask. Rather than saying, why don't they know about this? Is it because they're ignorant? We can say, no, actually, what's important here is the process. What is it for? What is the purpose of this womb? I've thought a bit about the materials in which wombs can be made, and I wonder whether accidents of survival privilege the terracotta over lost fabric uh, versions that, that might have been made. There certainly are clothing. Clothing was given to the gods in the ancient world. We know that there was fabric. It doesn't survive in almost all cases. 
I've also raised the questions of what is a body part? Is this a womb? What does womb mean in the ancient world? Does it mean the entire assemblage of female reproductive organs, or does it just mean the container part? Can we do more to actually look at the philology of this to work out what's being discussed? The objects usually identified as wombs are not shown in the way we would represent a womb today, but that doesn't mean that the people in the past didn't know, it just means they had different questions and different purposes. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. There were a myriad of things which could and did go wrong with the womb, and a myriad of treatments to fix them. Chlorosis, or green sickness, was a disease usually of young women. It was described as commonly a disease of virgins, and one possible cause cited was that their menstruation had been delayed. Alongside bloodletting, treacle and nutmeg, the most commonly cited treatment was carnal copulation. But this was the supposed treatment for women who had never menstruated, for those who had menstruated in the past but it had now stopped and needed to be restarted, the treatment was different. One printed recipe book, John Moncrief's Poor Man's Physician, prescribed as follows, quote, Take cinnamon and amber and saffron, make them into a powder to be taken diverse mornings. Other recipes from the same text contained lavender, honey, marigold flowers, chestnut and sugar. Another text, Taylor's Ready Doctor, gave the following recipe for a difficult birth. Quote, Let the midwife often anoint the woman's womb with oils of lilies, sweet almonds and the like. Anoint her navel with the oil of amber. Apply the gall of a hen to the navel. Eagle stone or load stone fastened to the hips. See that the woman have no precious stones about her, either in rings or otherwise. The last bit of that recipe, about the stones, relates to objects which were common elements of folk remedies. Curing stones. Curing stones were shared amongst communities and passed down through generations. The stones could vary in size from great boulders to small pebbles. They could be made from many things, including crystal, flint, jet or fossils. The key to their claimed success were the accompanying rituals. The sick person might have to lie on the stone, carry it with them, or have it passed over their body. The type of cloth the stone was wrapped in, or what it was washed with, was often considered key to the medical outcome. There were different stones for different complaints, so while one might be the stone used to alleviate joint pain, another would be for diseases of the heart or the head. There were also specific stones to cure sterility, stones to reduce the pain of childbirth, and stones for serpent bites. It was also believed that if the stone was looked for but found to be missing, that was a sign that it was the sick person's time to die. When a woman was unable to conceive, there were different treatments depending whether she wanted a boy or a girl. There were many and diverse treatments for barrenness, including, quote, the stone that is found in the stomach or brains of an eagle, taken in meat or drink, or bind this stone to the right arm of a man or woman before copulation. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe. .ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you. <laughs>